Hey guys, today we're going to talk about how to determine uh, the uh, spring force equation for your spring in the spring lab, and then also how to fill out that table of values relating to the mechanical energy of your spring, at, well, the mass spring system during the oscillation. Um, so let's start with your graph of weight versus extension. Um, you should have already got feedback on your graph back from me. Uh, in case you didn't, though, remember, the vertical axis should be the weight, which is mass times gravity. And the mass should be in kilograms, because if you use grams, then you're actually graphing millinewtons, and your slope is going to be all kinds of weird, mostly just a 1,000 times too large. And then your extension should be in meters. This is not the length of the spring. It is the extension. So if you say, oh, yeah, we hung the weight on it, and it was 20.2 centimeters, and then 21.6 or something, those are going to be the wrong values. Okay, You want to subtract the length of the spring when it had something hung on it from the unextended length of the spring. And so your value should be relatively small things like 2.3 centimeters, but converted into meters. Because if you forget to do that, then your slope will be 100 times uh, too small. Okay, so the slope should be your spring constant. The y-intercept would be your loading force, which remember is the minimum force needed to start the spring stretching in the first place. If it's not a positive number, you messed up. Okay, and if this is a teeny tiny number, either you have some problems with your units or your axes are flipped. All right, now, all of that you should have already taken care of, but just in case, there you go, quick review on that. Um, now, my numbers here are obviously made up. This is not based on anything. I was just saying, all right, if I made a graph, this might be what my spring force equation is. It's just the equation of my line. So I'm going to actually use my made up spring force equation to do all the other things that you're going to have to do in this lab report. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do is talk about the elastic potential energy equation. You are used to using 1 half kx squared because for a linear spring with no loading force, that is the elastic potential energy equation. Uh, but if there's a loading force, then you can't use that one because the loading force itself does a little bit of work, you know, as you're stretching this thing. Um, the idea here is since potential energy is the integral of force, uh, it's not just 1 half kx squared because it's the area under this graph here. And note, you have your triangle, but you also have this little rectangle down here. So this height is kx plus b, your y-intercept. And that means that this triangular portion has an area of 1 half kx squared, but this rectangle down here has an area of bx. And so therefore, your actual correct elastic potential energy formula in the event that there is a loading force is 1 half kx squared plus bx. All right, so this is the function I'm going to be using. Um, you know, using my made-up spring force here. Just, you can't use 1 half kx squared in doing any of the calculations in the rest of the lab, okay? So make sure that you are using this type of equation, not just 1 half kx squared. Okay, uh, next thing I'm going to do is look at the graph of position versus time for your oscillating mass and talk about how to use that to fill out your... Uh, results table for part two. Now for the graph of your oscillation, which I've drawn one kind of like it right here, um, the purpose of the lab really is centered around this because the purpose is to show that mechanical energy is conserved during the oscillation of mass on the spring. If you recall, mechanical oscillation, or sorry, mechanical energy is the sum of kinetic and potential energy. 
So that means that if I take the energy at any particular moment during the oscillation, it should always add up to the same amount. So that means that through all the calculations we're going to do here, if I get that the mechanical energy is some constant amount, I probably did something right. I probably did it right if they are all relatively similar. On the other hand, if I get that it gradually is going up in value or, in, or the other way, or just they're wildly different from each other, then I probably messed up somewhere. So you want E mechanical to be all very similar because after all, that's what the lab is supposed to demonstrate to you is that energy is conserved. All right, now I've labeled a couple of points on my, uh, my oscillation here. It's some kind of a sine curve. And this, of course, is, you know, the top of the motion when the mass was farthest away from the motion sensor. Down here, this is the bottom of motion, right, when it was closest to the motion sensor. Um, and so what that means in terms of, you know, the motion of the mass is... that it, it has the least extension at that position, the most extension at that position, and the equilibrium extension directly in between. Okay, now, um, in order to do all my various calculations, I have to be able to figure out, all right, what the height of the mass is at each of those spots, what the extension is at each of those spots. All right, and then we'll talk about how to get um, okay, so first, the height. Don't use 0.85 and 0.73 or whatever your graph happened to say they were. Right? You don't want to do that because um, the conservation of mechanical energy really doesn't depend on how high you set your ring stand or how far off the ground you set your motion sensor or something. Okay, That actually should not be relevant to the experiment. Um, rather, you're going to call the bottom zero because that's what we always do when we talk about gravitational potential energy is we just say the bottom wherever that is is zero all right so that means that if my numbers here are 0.73 was the lowest position and 0.85 was the highest the difference between those is 0.12 so at the top it's 0.12 meters above the bottom all right, in the middle, it's half of that, so 0 0.06 meters above the bottom. Okay. All right, so getting the height should be a relatively straightforward matter of just subtract to get the top one and half of that to get what the middle is. All right, getting the extensions, though, is a little bit more involved. Um, the, the reason it's more involved, of course, is there's nothing about this right here that tells you what the extension of the spring was. You know that at the top, it was the least extended, and that at the bottom, it was most extended. But that doesn't really tell you what the equilibrium extension is. Fortunately, you have an equation for the force exerted by the spring. And also, fortunately, you know how much mass you were oscillating, which is a really important number to write down here. All right, so um, I'm going to, for my calculation, say that uh, I pretend oscillated a half kilogram, so 500 grams. But of course, don't leave that as 500 grams. You want to make sure you convert that into kilograms. So I'm going to use 0.5 kilograms for all the calculations I'm going to do. If you're not sure which one you had, half a kilogram, a whole kilogram. Okay. So you should now be able to identify which one you had if you were paying any attention to your setup. Okay. Now, um, the uh, top and bottom, so on and so forth, I, I, that's not where I'm going to start. I'm going to actually start with the middle with the equilibrium extension. The way you will find your equilibrium extension is by saying, well, at equilibrium, the spring force is equal to the weight 
of the object. Maybe I should have put those in different colors. But here goes, slightly more blown up. Kx plus b equals mg. So using my bogus made up values here, okay, if I've got um, k is 25, I'm trying to solve for the equilibrium extension. My loading force B is 0.75. My mass was 0.5 kilograms. And gravity is 9.8. I should be able to do a little bit of algebra and solve for my equilibrium extension, which I will spare you. Okay, a little bit of algebra later, we've determined that the equilibrium extension, so at the middle, is 0.166. Again, there's nothing about this graph that would tell you that. We base that on our spring force equation and the weight that we hung on it. Okay, the top is six centimeters in this case above the middle. So that means that my extension would be six centimeters, 0 0.06 meters less than at the middle. So in order to go from, or in, a, in order to calculate the extension at the top, I'm going to take my equilibrium and subtract the difference in height between the middle and the top, which is 0 0.06. So at the top, my extension would be 0.106. We do the opposite for the bottom, right? The bottom is extended by this much more. And so therefore, the extension at the bottom is going to be 0.226, assuming that I did my addition correctly. All right. So that's how you have your extensions, All right? So it's based on find equilibrium, and then you're adding or subtracting more or less half of your height because that's how much the extension changed by between those positions. All right, for the speed. Uh, at the top, it stops, because that's why it's the top. At the bottom, it stops, for the same reason. It wouldn't be top or bottom if it was still moving. For the middle, if you're tempted to like calculate that or something using conservation of energy, that's not the right idea. The point of the lab is to show conservation of energy. So instead, what you do is you look up the speed in the data table that you got. So the speed at the middle, at equilibrium, you should remember is the largest. The largest speed happens at equilibrium. So you should be able to, as long as your you know, data doesn't have any like funky peaks or something like that, you should be able to just look through your data table and find something that seems like that's the largest speed and it's some reasonable non-outlier sort of a value. So I'm gonna take a random guess here and say my max speed was 0.45. I have no basis for that number. I just made that up, but you are going to base it on your data table. So find something that looks like the maximum speed, and that should be the speed at the equilibrium position, as long as it doesn't seem like an outrageous number. Okay, um, next is calculating these. So I'll just describe that. I won't bore you with the details. MGH, you have M, you know what G is, and here's H. So you should have three different values here. That one, of course, is zero. Elastic potential energy. Don't use one half kx squared. Use that one, one half kx squared plus bx. If you leave out the bx, you'll have really stupid values there, and it will not work out the mechanical energy is concerned. So you do have to make sure to use the correct potential energy function. All right, and then of course we have one half mv squared, and then mechanical energy is just these three added up. All right, and then they should all three be the same, ideally. All right, last thing is calculate a percent difference. You should have the formula for percent difference. If not, then go look back at the uh, lab directions handout that's in the unit zero folder and you should find it there. Thanks. Let me know if you have any questions.